So hi, and today's webinar is Substantiating Advertising Claims in the USA. Um, so I know most of you today will either be looking at entering the market in the USA or looking at, or in the USA already and just wanting to hear a bit more information about substantiating advertising claims in the USA. So to go through the agenda, um, we'll be looking at the advertising standards and the organisations that are regulating them. Um, so kind of a breakdown basically of anyone you need to be aware of if you're advertising in the USA and kind of signposting you on you know where you can find the right information uh, more specific to what you're kind of advertising. Uh, we'll look at some advertising laws um, because obviously it's not just the organizations you need to be aware of but where you can find the laws. Um, how you can validate those advertising claims so how do we substantiate what we're saying and some examples of case studies, which will show some successful advertising campaigns as well. And some examples of some bad advertising cases and we've drawn adverts. Uh, so hopefully we'll get a really good well-rounded picture of how we're looking at substantiating those claims and everything you need to be aware of. Uh, this is being recorded, um, so don't worry if you need to dash off at any point. I'll be sending out the recording to everyone at the end of the webinar. Uh, and there's also gonna be a chance for a Q&A at the end. Um, so if you've got any questions as we go through, please feel free to make a note of those um, because at the end I'll open up to a bit of a question and answer. So to introduce myself, <laughs> uh, I'm Karis and I'm the Regulatory Director at Aiton Global Research. So we're a consumer research company, so obviously I'm not a specialist in every kind of regulation, um, maybe specific cosmetics or anything like that, but basically we test a lot of FMCG products. And we obviously, our evidence is used to substantiate advertising claims. So the regulations that I'm really focused on are to do with advertising um, and how our research and our evidence can be affected in different territories, making sure that we're providing the right evidence and you can use it where you need to and your claims will be compliant. Um, but also, you know, focusing on things like uh, cosmetic regulations in certain countries um, and any other kind of, again, FMCG sector we're working with, just making sure that all the research we're providing and all the information we're giving you to make sure you can use that evidence to launch your products is correct as much as I can do. Um, so I've been working at the company for about eight years now. Uh, so I started off as a study manager. So I'll talk about it a bit later, but every time you do a study, with Aiden Global Research, you get a bespoke study manager who will get to know you as a client inside and out, know what your research objectives are while you're doing the study. And it just means you've got a really personalised service. Um, so certainly we have clients that place studies on every week. Uh, so it's really good to know that your, your study manager knows exactly what your pro processes and procedures are to make sure everything goes ahead. Um, but it meant I learned a lot about study design, questionnaire design, and again, all the regulations that were involved. So that's what's led me to this kind of story today. And obviously, I love doing these weekly webinars um, to kind of share what I know and hopefully give you some uh, insight into what I know as well. So I'm mainly going to talk about cosmetics today. Don't feel like you need to switch off if you're not part of the cosmetics industry. Um, a lot of it is still applicable or still all the advertising standards are still going to be applicable or the organisations. But I know most of you are going to be from the cosmetics industry. Um, and certainly it's where we see a lot of advertising claims, um, making products stand out, making sure that the benefits on our products um, stand out against our competitors and that they're substantiated is huge within the cosmetics and personal care market. But again, it will be applicable either way. Um, but to give a kind of overview of what the cosmetics market is within the USA, it's obviously the largest cosmetics market in the world. So I know if you haven't obviously launched your product in the USA yet, you may be very keen on doing that. And if you're looking at setting up a brand in the USA, or even if you're currently selling in the USA and you just want to make your products bigger and get your advertising out there more, it's definitely the place to be doing it. So it's about it's worth about 93.5 billion. That's money that I can't even comprehend. So we know it's a lot of money um, and, and certainly sells a huge over there. But it's definitely a really contested market as well. So again, I keep powering it through, but they're making sure that you've got those advertising claims there. It's gonna be the most important thing to make sure you can stand out. Um, why is it growing? So they think that there's a huge demand for natural cosmetics. Um, we're seeing a lot of that just because it's natural doesn't mean it doesn't need uh, research and advertising behind it um, it certainly does so there's still a good market to be in there um, it's all growing the working women population is increasing and obviously that's the the main target market for any cosmetic no matter what the kind of benefits are they tend to be marketed towards working women 
obviously if it's a different market it's a different market but this is why we're seeing a kind of um a growth in the market there um, the impact of COVID-19, I feel like we can't avoid it at the moment, um, obviously, <laughs> but I, I always also want to talk about it in my webinars to make sure we're not kind of avoiding the subject. Um, so obviously there's been a drop, um, there's a predicted 2.5% drop in the US in the personal care market, um, which is very large if you think about how much that is in those billions. We're talking a lot of money. Um, so obviously there's going to be a slight drop, but I think what's really important to note is it doesn't mean you should stop producing your products. If anything, it means we need to keep producing them because when people pick up again, um, they certainly will. Um, online sales have obviously been the thing that's kept the personal care industry going. Um, so even though our bricks and mortar sales are, are not doing the same, uh, it, we've seen, um, so Statista found that in uh, March, in four weeks, uh, the um, value of skincare products um, increased basically. And there was a huge amount of sales happening. So people are still shopping online. Again, it's really important to make sure our advertising is compliant. It's really in the public eye when it's online. Um, so just important things to think about. So advertising, who regulates them? So starting off with the Federal Trade Commission, because these are the people that regulate adverts in the USA. So they're protecting consumers and also promoting competition. Obviously, if you're saying claims that are not substantiated, they're unfair, you're not really helping your competition at all. You want to have, um, you know, fair practice and honest adverts, because it really means that we're all kind of trying to produce the next best product. Competition is very important for any kind of industry. But also it's really important for our consumers. We don't want to make, we don't want to be lying to them, making sure we're, they're buying our products when we're not actually telling the truth about them. Um, so that is what the FTC are looking at. So they're also looking at a global marketplace as well. Um, so, you know, any products that are being imported into the USA are being investigated on that kind of sense as well. So, again, if you're not based in the USA, but you are thinking of selling there, um, you'll still need to be really, really aware of what their kind of code of conducts are and all of the information that they're putting out there. So they're enforcing all laws that basically prevent fraud, deception and unfair business practices. So quite simply, again, I think it always comes back to me to evidence. If you've got evidence behind your claims, you're probably going to be pretty safe. Um, obviously, it depends what those claims are and what you're saying. <laughs> um, but generally, it always comes back to evidence. Um, so they, they, as it says, you know, they have to be truthful. They can't be deceptive or unfair and they must be evidence based. You can't just sort of say your product does this thing because you think it does. Um, you can't say a moisturizer nourishes the skin if you've got nothing to say that it does. It has to be some evidence behind it. Um, and the FTC do provide resources for claims as well. So if there's any claims that you're not sure you're allowed to make, even if they're substantiated or not, you can have a little look on the FTC website. So it's a bit of just a starting point, really, if you're looking at advertising in the USA. There's also the Best of Business Bureau National Program. So this will be a bit more familiar to people that are advertising outside of the USA. Um, I know in my other webinars, I talk about it a lot about ad self-regulation. So that's not the case in the USA. It's federal, which is the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, you've still got the BBB national programs. They kind of work as ad self-regulation in the fact they have a code of conduct and they're basically trying to make sure um, that people can self-regulate their ads without having to have a dispute um, through the federal agencies, basically. So they've got, um, it's a national programs, basically. So they're putting out information to make sure you know, people are doing everything themselves, making sure that their adverts are uh, compliant in the USA. Um, so hopefully we won't have to get the FTC involved at that point. Um, so there's, yeah, there's basically, again, the same kind of thing, making sure that there's innovation and competition, um, but also making sure that um, it's fair practice. So they're a really good place to look at as well, if you're advertising in the USA, basically. There's also Ad Sanders Canada. I wanted to talk about Canada from talking about the USA because generally a lot of people who are selling in the USA are also selling in Canada. Um, so Canada is exactly like other um, countries like the UK, if you're from the UK or other countries in Europe, they do have an advertising self-regulatory organization. Um, which is Ad Sanders Canada. So again, it's got a complaints platform as does the FTC. Sorry, forgot to mention that one. Um, so it basically means that the, the adverts are regulated in a complaints basis. So once a product goes on the market, 
Um, people might complain about the product, say, oh, it didn't work. It claims to do this, but I didn't know it's a difference. It claims to make my hair 10 times stronger. I didn't think my hair was stronger at all. It didn't seem to fall out any less when I brushed it. This kind of thing. So that might be a consumer's complaining about your product and they'll either go to the FTC or add standards. Um, or you, you might be your competitor as well. So again, with that kind of claim, makes hair 10 times stronger. One of your competitors might have done tests on their products and only got five times stronger. And they'll say, well, I don't know how they've got 10 times stronger because we haven't managed to get that claim. So we're going to complain about them. Um, so it, it kind of works on that basis. So again, always be really conscious of putting your products out there because even if your consumers might kind of be tricked by your claims, it's usually your competitors that won't be. Even if they're not tricked by your claims, they might just try and complain because you're selling more products than them and they're not convinced you've got evidence behind it. So they might try and catch you out. Um, so always make sure you've got that, um, that the evidence in place so you can kind of avoid this complaints procedure anyway. So they'll approach you basically if they have complaints, they'll ask for your evidence and it will all go from there. Um, if you don't have any evidence in place, obviously your adverts will be withdrawn in the first instance, um, but obviously things can get progressed if you don't withdraw out your adverts. It sounds like you're just withdrawing your advert, but if you've got adverts um, online, obviously you can take them offline. If you've got adverts on your pack, on your packaging, if you've got claims on your packaging that aren't substantiated, that could be a whole product recall. So it can really be a leveling amount of difference if you don't have your claims substantiated on your products. But back to Ag standards um, specifically. So they've got obviously a code of conduct. Um, so you can have a look at that to make sure again that you're abiding by everything you need to do in um, Canada. But they also do advert pre-clearance, which I think is really good. Um, this is something that uh, Clearcast do in the UK for TV, if people are familiar with that. Um, so before it goes onto the market, they can have a look at your advert and check your evidence and everything like that. So it's a really good system if you, um, if you haven't used it before, because it really negates that worry about getting your product on the market and thinking, I have got my evidence, I think I've done everything right, I've used their code of conduct, but you might still end up with a complaint. It does happen. Um, so it is, it's a good way to get that pre-cleared before you go on and have that confidence behind your advertising. Examples of advertising law. Um, so again, we've got our standards that are regulating our adverts. We know what their code of conduct is. We've had a look into it. We're happy with our adverts, but there could be something you've overlooked in, in the law behind advertising. So just wanted to bring up a couple of examples. Um, so there's the Nutrition Labeling and Education Act um, by the FDA, which is the Food and Drug Administration. I will talk about them in a bit. Um, so food labeling uh, for terms such as free, low, light, light, reduced, less and high um, have got uh, definite, they've basically got definitions behind them and you need to make sure you follow those definitions if you're going to use those kinds of words in your advertising. Um, so there's some full regulations there. It's just examples about how simple um, just having those words in them, can, it can be so hardly regulated so highly regulated. Um, so you can't just kind of just go willy nilly and sort of say words on your advertising. You need to be aware of the regulations that are in place as well. And I wanted to bring up the Competition Act in Canada as well, but just because you can see that the, um, the pub punishments, basically the penalties um, for going against the Com Competition Act, um, it says about 10 million for corporate, corporate corporations, 10 million which is just crazy amounts of money. So you really wanna make sure you're aware of all these kinds of laws in place so you don't get a crazy fine um, if anything goes wrong. Just back to COVID-19, like I said, we don't wanna avoid the, su the subject <laughs> when we're going through the webinar. Um, basically, it's just to let you know, and this is certainly something that's been really picked up on the FTC, just because COVID-19 is happening doesn't mean the advertising standards and laws don't still exist. So please make sure that you're being really aware of it and being really responsible through the COVID-19 process. It's basically relating to a lot of things like we've seen adverts be called upon um, by the FDC, which say things like, oh, this face mask will cure um, COVID-19. Uh, this hand sanitizer will make you 100% safe against it. These are claims that can't be made and they're basically exploiting people's fear to make sure you can sell your products. And then we really wanna avoid doing that. So make sure just to be really aware it is good to use COVID-19 to sell products. We've got a lot of our clients 
who didn't previously manufacture hand sanitizer. They're now manufacturing it, but they're doing it properly. And they're selling great products because obviously there was like a huge national shortage. So people really wanted it. It's fantastic. What a great thing to do. Produce those products, make the money from it. But just be really conscious of what you're advertising and saying about it and make sure you're still following those code of conducts. So the food and drug administration. So we've gone about advertising law and um, all those regu all those uh, organizations, but I want to talk specifically about cosmetics again. Um, again, if you're in any industry which is food and drug related, it was to apply to you. Um, but it's just bringing it back to what you need to be really cautious of when you're advertising cosmetics in the USA. Um, so the FDA are the ones that regulate cosmetics. So unlike other countries, products that are placed in the market don't need pre-market approval. They do have a process if you want to, but a lot of products that are going on the market aren't actually pre-registered, um, which is why we kind of have a bit of a wild west in the USA of unsubstantiated claims. Um, because people are kind of just putting the product on the market, maybe not even knowing that these regulations are there. It's generally the thing, it's generally not sinister. People aren't trying to mess up the market. They aren't trying to go against um, their competitors. They simply have gone, I've made this product. I really want to sell it. I really think it's good um, and have just sold it. So it's really important to make sure um, that you are, are really aware of the regulations yourself <laughs> because there's not that pre-market approval. You want to make sure that you've abided by everything before it goes on there or use their pre-clearance as well. Um, so they can also pursue enforcement actions like the FTC um, if you're not compliant with the legislation specific to cosmetic products. And again, that also is affected by anyone importing their product, not just people that are USA companies selling in the USA. So again, be super aware of what the regulations are. The main thing to be really wary of with cosmetic claims, um, and this is actually the same globally, it's not just the USA itself, is making sure that your claims are not medicinal or drug um, related in, in the USA. This is because you simply can't make a cosmetic claim, a, a claim about a cosmetic product, which is a, a medical claim. So the difference is, is obviously drugs are supposed to cure, or prevent disease or treat it, whereas cosmetic products are simply just to, well, it, as the definition says, cleanse, beautify, promote attractiveness or to alter the appearance. So there, you can definitely have secondary claims. Um, we often see, you know, this could also be suitable for people with eczema prone skin. But that should not be your primary claim on a product if you are a cosmetic product. And obviously, if you're going to go down the drug route and you're going to be going through a lot more kind of um, regulations, a lot more um, authorization, pre-market approval, registering a product. So most of the time you want to avoid that and stick to being a cosmetic product as well. So just that's the main thing to be wary of. If you're ever selling a cosmetic product, if you're ever making claims about your cosmetic product, do not make drug claims about them and make sure they're cosmetic. So that's kind of the overall thing there. Cosmetic claims still have to be truthful and should not mislead consumers. So again, we're bringing it back to evidence. As long as we've got evidence, we've substantiated or validated our claims, uh, we're going to be able to uh, make sure they're truthful. So how do we validate those claims? <laughs> Two seconds. So consumer research is what I provide at Asian Global Research. So that's what I'm talking about mainly today. Obviously there's clinical research as well, which really holds its place. Um, if people want some more information about the differences between consumer and clinical, please ask me for a recording of my webinar last week, um, which I hosted with our managing partner in Germany, Thomas, because we do a really good breakdown of what the difference is and you know, what's appropriate and when. But honestly, consumer research can be used for pretty much any claim. It's to do with the wording of the claim um, and what, well, what the claim is, it's perception based. So clinical claims tend to be objective. So a measurement, something that's done by science. Uh, you can't sort of see by the naked eye, it's something that has to be measured. Whereas a consumer perception claim is anything that consumer can perceive themselves with a naked eye. So you might say something um, clinically like my the hair is, you know, hair is 10 times stronger, we'll go back to that one. Whereas a consumer claim, a perception claim, might be, you know, I notice less hair fall out, um, my hair, you know, looks stronger, it feels like I'm fuller, healthier, the kind of things that relate to it, but that could only be perceived with a naked eye. So that's what we're looking at. Um, so there's much more marketing claims as well. They're much more personal claims when we're looking at consumer claims as well. Things like I would buy this product, I would recommend this product to a friend. They can't be measured 
through clinical studies, they have to be held by the consumer. So, you know, we, we always offer, offer advice as well. If there's a certain amount of claims that you want, um, if there's certain claims that you have in mind, we can suggest whether you need clinical or consumer research for it. And we've got partners that can offer those kinds of studies that we can't as well. But back to what a consumer study is, it's generally an in-home test. So we're reflecting the actual conditions of the product in use. So sending out products through the mail, volunteers receive it and answer an online questionnaire. This is a really good reflection of real data, essentially. When you put your product on the market and they read those usage directions and they use the product, this is the effects that they're getting, um, not something that someone's applying in a lab. As mentioned, um, adverts are policed by a complaints basis. So if you've tested it in the real life and you've had real life consumers have their opinion about a product, the chances are you're not going to have complaints about it because you've monitored it in exactly that way. So it can be a really effective way of, of substantiating those claims in a, in a real life setting, um, as well as things like gathering adverse reaction data as well. So we don't want adverse reactions on our studies, but it can happen. And it's a really good way of getting the actual perception of that, rather than again, a small sort of test of 20 people in a clinic, clinical test, test um, in a safety test, a patch test, and seeing if there's an irritation. Once it's gone through that clearance, and we send the product to 100 people, are people still getting adverse reactions? And in, if so, what's their opinion about that? It's not kind of something, again, that's more science based. So generally, they're assessing one product on its own, again, maybe for claim substantiation, or they might be looking at comparing products as well. So benchmark studies, um, comparisons, uh, or reformulation and things like that. So kind of giving a breakdown of that a bit more. Why conduct consumer research? Obviously, claim substantiation. That's what we're talking about mainly today. But a lot of these other points can really relate back to that as well. So obviously make it a part of your new product development. So it's something we're quite passionate about is don't kind of go, oh, well, I need to, you know, I've got these, this product, I've got these claims, um, it's on the market, I really want to make sure any complaints about it. Can I substantiate them? Yes, that's something that can be done. Um, but generally what we want to do is build it into our new product development so that as we're developing our products, we're thinking about what claims we need and what we're going to say about the product um, and what testing we'll need to have to, to make sure they're substantiated. So it's something that really should be built into your processes. It can help with your product and brand perceptions. So even if, you're, um, if, if you've got a claim substantiation study, for example, um, you want to do it debranded, so you know the efficacy claims are being have no bias about them. But at the end of the study, you then want to reveal your brand and say the uh, and sort of say you know now you know it's this brand. Would you pay this much price for this product? Um, now you know how it works. Uh, and you can get a good perception about that product and the propensity to buy as well. So again, establishing price points. So benchmark testing, again, um, so that could be against a competitor or you might have different formulations. You want to find out which formulation is the best one. You can do that all through consumer research. You might want to investigate new markets. Obviously, in the um, sort of topic of today, it might be that you haven't launched into the USA before. So you want to test your product in the USA and make sure it's accepted there before you launch it, as well as substantiating those claims. Uh, and testimonials and reviews as well. So it's, it's a really good way to get some actual feedback, some relatable feedback about your product in a kind of quote from the study um, to say that it does what it does. The good thing about doing it through a consumer test and doing it as a testimonial rather than just a product review is you're making sure that you're not going against any kind of um, laws and legislation about product reviews. It's a substantiated testimonial that is going alongside your study. So it's a really good way of getting um, that kind of more qualitative feedback to put on your website. So back to claims. We've got our advertising laws and legislation and we've made sure that we've done our consumer research and our claims are compliant with that legislation. Now, where do we use it and how can we use it to make sure our product really stands out? So here's some examples of some products that are on, uh, this is on people's websites. So you've got LMS, Charlotte Tilbury, Estee Lauder. So all consumer research studies and people have used those quotes and got um, and managed to promote them through the claims on their website. And as you can see, it can really help a product stand out. So things like LMS, we've got all 100% agrees, which is an incredibly high um, product study, a product test. Charlotte Tilbury, again, really, really high um, claims on their, on their products there. And then again, Estee Lauder, done a slightly different approach. So they've kind of said what it will 
um, you know, what it does overall, all of those claims have to be substantiated and then picked out a couple of claims. They just put, put the perception claims on them as well. So that there's different ways of doing it. It doesn't have to always be percentage. You can just state it and then put somewhere else on the website to say, you know, where that evidence has come from. Um, but it does look really effective. I think it stands out more than products that don't have any kind of um, percentage on them. Same as TV. So if you're advertising your product on TV, you need to include any claims, um, any substantiation you have there. So I've got some examples there from um, Vaseline and L'Oreal. Um, L'Oreal have got a slightly different one there that I wanted to point out because they're not sort of agreeing with the claim. Um, it's, it says it matches more than any other color. So we're not necessarily testing the product and saying what the effects and benefits are there. The claim is to do with a mass market research survey and saying basically about people finding their shade and making sure that we've got the evidence to substantiate that. So it's not always a product performance claim that we're talking about, um, but it all needs substantiate, substantiating. So it's yeah, just another thing to think about there. Uh, advertising claims on social media, we've got Augustina Spader on um, Instagram and Elemis on Facebook. So they've kind of put up these percentage degree claims again. It's a really nice way of highlighting some claims um, in your social media as well. We see a lot of our clients do it. So instead of just kind of putting on there what it does, uh, you know, instead of just saying, oh, it makes it more supple, you're just pushing through that you've, you've got this evidence behind your claims. You're not just saying it. Obviously, everyone needs to anyway, but I think, I, I, I think it shouldn't be always seen as something you need to have it because it's legal and it's compliant with the law. Really publish that, um, those consumer claims and, and all of your advertising claims because they'll really speak to your consumers and they'll make you trust your brand as well. If they can see that you have got this information behind your claims, um, they'll really want to purchase your products. So shopping channels as well. I think there is no country better than the US at shopping channels. Um, so I'm going to show you a little clip just to give you an idea of uh, how consumer study claims have been used on QVC. Um, so I've got to do the whole change of this um, sharing screen, which is always fun. So you guys should be able to see this and I'll just play this little clip. They, we've done research on whether or not this actually produces results. We have, and again, I think pictures said a thousand Let's, words. Yeah. Can I show you? So yeah. Here's the results, and then I want to show you the before and afters. Mm -hmm. So in a consumer study after two weeks, every single woman said that the texture of their skin was smoother. That's every incredible. single woman. You can't get every woman to agree on where we want to go to for dinner. I know. You know, or what movie we want to I see, know. right? You got to do like Duck, Duck, Goose, or I don't know, Rochambeau. <laughs> Paper, scissors, rock. Sorry. 95% said it's balanced and not oily. But again, whether you've oily skin or dry skin or combo skin, this is going to be great. After four weeks, every single woman said that their skin had a healthy glow and Whoa. the appearance of their skin was brighter. That's what exfoliation does for you. 95% said that the skin tone was more even, and 90% said that their skin felt hydrated, balanced, supple. So the. <laughs> So as you can see, they are very good at advertising on uh, QVC and using those claims to make it really exciting for the consumers that are watching. Let's share back on the presentation. So obviously it has to be substantiated. For shopping channels anyway, they do evaluate your evidence before, you know, when you go to register your product on there. So it's not like they're kind of um, looking at that afterwards. You have to have the evidence in place already. I won't go through it all, but it gives you an example of what kind of, um, what kind of, uh, rules they have in place for the evidence that you need to submit at QVC and again other shopping channels will have different varying kind of um, rules that they need but generally it's all going to follow the same kind of pattern so if you're thinking of shopping on shopping channels again make sure you've got that evidence in place um, so it's not just about how good it looks on, on the TV which it did it, I think it's really um, going to help people purchase those products but it needs to be done anyway otherwise you simply can't get your products on there. So we've talked about where you can see these claims and who's going to regulate them. But now I just want to go through some case studies of those studies um, that I've talked about, consumer research studies, and how we actually design the study to make sure you can say those claims about your product. So there's going to be a couple of case studies. I've got a female product, a male product, just to give you a bit of idea of different claims that we're looking at substantiating. And the first one I want to talk about is a um, premium British beauty brand who are launching into the USA and they're launching a day cream. So they want to make sure that they're substantiating all of the claims in their products, but mainly the reason they want to test in the USA is because they want it in varying climates. So 
that even though they're a British beauty brand, if we tested in the UK, it's all kind of the same weather. Most of the time it's cold or a thunderstorm like it is today. Um, it's occasionally hot, but generally it's the same nationally. Whereas in the USA, as you'll know if you're based there, some states are really, really hot and you go into an aircon when you go inside and some states can get really, really cold and you'll go into heating when you go inside. So we tested it at a time of year when we'd have that kind of uh, juxtaposition of climates um, to make sure that people, it was suitable for everyone, no matter where they were going into hot to cold or cold to hot, um, that these claims were going to be uh, withstanding those changes in climate. It's really important for them. So in terms of the legislation specifically, so we've talked about who actually regulates it, but what do they say about these, uh, you know, what do they actually say in their code of conduct that I keep talking about? So the FTC say that advertising must be truthful and non-deceptive. Advertisers must have evidence to back up their claims and advertisements cannot be unfair. So obviously we need to make sure we've got this evidence in place so that it's not deceptive. So the protocol for this study in particular, it was in the USA and people were speaking English. Uh, single placement study, so one product's being investigated. We ran the study for four weeks because we knew that's when the claim should, you know, the, the product was going to have benefits. So always communicate with the formulation chemist you're working with because they will know when the effect should start to, you know, well, when the product should start to have an effect and show the claims that you want to make. The participants had um, all skin types. We wanted to make sure we had a range of all skin types um, so we can make that claim. They had signs of aging because we wanted to get some claims about the improvements in aging. Again, we've got a hot and cold climate. It needed to be national to be able to reflect that. And the participants also had to be users of luxury brands. So the great thing about consumer research is you can really target the um, end user that you are expecting to purchase your product. So if you've got a luxury brand, you may want to use people that are always using kind of high end of brands because you know that they're gonna be the people that will be purchasing your product. So how do we break down the data? So I've lifted a few um, questions from our report. So our reports are in real time. So as soon as you get the, um, the the minimum amount of people, say it's 100 people, reply to the questionnaire. You can download the report straight away. You haven't got to wait for a student analysis because it's all built into our system. So this is the summary kind of report that you get. So again, I've just selected a few questions. As you can see, you've got the questions on the left hand side. You've got your neutral people, people that number of people that have said um, satisfied, sorry. The neutral, the not satisfied and then the percentage of people that have said satisfied and not satisfied. So the percentage is what we're really looking at because as we've seen on the online claims and in the social media, they've quoted the percentage of people. It also lets us know if the claim has actually passed, if we've hit the right percentage. So generally um, people will, well, statistically we set it as 66% because it's a statistical majority, but generally people like to go to about 70% because it can cover for different advertising platforms as well. Some people are quite specific, um, but also it gives you that kind of that um, confidence behind your claims to know that they're definitely substantiated. You've got a good amount. So there is, there's no definite rule there. Um, every, like I said, all the platforms tend to be the ones that guide the rules there, but it gives you an idea. I think 70% is a good claim. 80% is a great claim and 90% is an excellent claim. That's kind of how I think about it. I certainly wouldn't want to quote in your advertising anything that's lower than 70% because I just don't think it looks very good for a consumer. So as you can see, we've obviously got all of our, pa our claims have all passed here. So 80% of people said that it reduced the fine lines and wrinkles. 77% said it, um, it tackled multiple signs of aging. 91% have agreed with the um, skin feeling comfortable in all the environments, including the extreme temperature changes. So this is the really big claim because as we know, this is what um, the client really wanted is to be able to say about the varying in climates and that the skin would still feel comfortable. And 91% is such a huge amount of uh, a huge agreement percentage there. So we definitely got that claim and it can definitely be used in their advertising. Also got some claims there about the skin feeling softer and firmer. I'm oh, sorry, firmer and more hydrated. Gives you an idea basically of, of how that all lays out and how you can literally lift that into your advertising um, really, really easily from the reports. The second product I just want to talk about briefly is a male product. Um, so as I said, it's a day cream. 
And this was tested by a global leader in pharmacy and healthcare products. Uh, in this case, we wanted to substantiate the um, claims for anti-aging effects, uh, sensitive skin, and that it worked with facial hair. So again, this is why it's a male product in particular, um, because we really wanted to prove that as a moisturizer, it, well, I don't really know, but I'm sure if you're a male, you'll know. If you've got stubble, um, you don't want to get all the moisturizer caught up in there. You want to make sure it still absorbs into the skin and you're still able to use your moisturizer. So I wanted to bring out the Code of Conduct from Ant Standards Canada this time. We've talked about the FTC, um, but again, we know they're going to be marketing their product in Canada as well. So we want to make sure they are abiding by the Code of Conduct there. And essentially, it's, it's all the same sort of thing. We need to make sure we've got competent and reliable evidence. But the most important thing is that it needs to be disclosed upon request. So this is where we go back to saying, as I mentioned, there's no pre-market authorization to get to um, start advertising a product in the US. But if you do have a uh, complaint about your product, you need to make sure you've got that evidence immediately. Because obviously, um, you, yeah, you can't have a delay to your evidence. <laughs> so make sure you've got your study data before you market your product. So what's the protocol um, for this particular study? Again, it's single placement. Again, it's four weeks. We've got those aging claims. Uh, we've got 30 to 60 year old people because we want to make sure they're at an age where they're starting to see signs of aging. There need to be all skin types, but this time we're including at least 50% of people with sensitive skin. Uh, this is because we want to make sure that we can really definitely say the claim about sensitive skin in particular for all skin types. And to do that, instead of having a national representation, which might give us a really tiny number of sensitive skin and therefore not really give us enough data, if we just look at sensitive skin on its own, we might only have sort of 10 people. Um, whereas if we've got 50% of them, we've got 100 people in the study, we've got 50 people that will have sensitive skin that are agreeing that it's good to their skin. So it's really important to think about that as well if you're looking at all skin type claims and making sure you've got substantial data on your products. They had to use day cream and they had to have fine lines and wrinkles as well. So again, we've got the same kind of report. We've got the same questions we've drawn. Um, so again, these are really high claims, lovely to use in the uh, advertising, and the main claims have been substantiated. The skin looks younger, fine lines and wrinkles are reduced, and again, we've got that claim about um, easily absorbed in, over the facial hair. 75% of people agree. We're really confident that we can start marketing it towards people with facial hair. Uh, four weeks of use, anti-aging performance, 89%. Again, it's a really big percentage. So we're very confident with marketing of this product and that can all be used in the advertising. So here's the, there was the examples of good studies and good evidence you've got, how you can use them in your claims. What happens when you don't follow all of the kind of advice through the webinar and go to those kind of conducts? Well, here's a few examples. So uh, Clearasil, I, I'm sure everyone remembers this case. Um, basically they were banned because they're making medical claims as we talked about earlier. So by the FDA, um, obviously you can't say claims about a medical condition and acne is actually a medical condition. So they couldn't mark it as a cosmetic. It's not that the product didn't work. They had the evidence to say it worked, but it's a, it's a medicinal claim and not a cosmetic claim. So you can't say it. Um, Maybelline was sued over false claims uh, for a super stay 10 hour gloss um, that people feel felt was misleading, inaccurate and deceptive. So they were sued. So again, it's really important in the USA in particular, where there is a bit of a, um, as we know, a bit of a sue culture um, to make sure that you do have all of the evidence in base, because obviously if people think they're deceived, they are going to be very mad um, and they'll maybe want to take action against you. Um, also, I think everyone kind of remembers this case as well with Sunday Riley um, that were doing fake product reviews on their website. So obviously their products had to be withdrawn there. And again, it's kind of going back to where I was saying, if you've got claim substantiation, you don't need to resort to fake product reviews. You can get testimonials from the data, but also it means that if people are leaving product reviews, it's backed up by your science. So genuine product reviews, I mean. Uh, and obviously just don't make very important reviews about your products um, because obviously it'll get you in a lot of trouble. So it, it's just a few examples there of different types of advertising that have been called up upon and what not to do. So a bit more of advice for those consumer studies. Um, so it won't be long now, we'll move on to question and answer if anyone's got any burdening questions going. Um, so we want to make sure our panel size starts at around 100 responses. It changes for different studies, for different products, for different claims. But people always ask me, you know, what kind of ballpark am I looking at here if I'm doing a consumer study? I, I'd have 100 responses as a kind of starting idea. 
And like I said, budget requirement, if your claim will allow it, we can reduce the number. But also if you have claims um, that are you know, quite large, sort of things like all skin types, all hair types, we may want to even have more than 100 responses. So we can really advise you there, but 100 is always a good, good starting point. You need to inform your product liability insurance provider that you'll be doing um, consumer studies. So we've got product liability insurance ourselves to protect us against anything that could go wrong in the study and to protect you against anything that could go wrong in the study. But obviously you need to let your provider know that as well. Uh, samples have to be safety tested. Uh, so we can't um, send any samples out to our consumers or to our panelists if the products aren't safe to the uh, to the level that they need to be for you to start selling the product. So again, people kind of ask me what kind of safety testing do you need? It's essentially full safety testing. We need to make sure that there's not going to be a risk of adverse reaction to our panelists. Uh, samples should be blind if they are uh, for uh, claims instantiation. So there shouldn't be any branding on the products. We don't want to have any bias about the brand uh, when we're doing our claim support. And your questionnaire design needs to reflect those claims as well. So it can happen. Uh, poor questionnaire design can be the kind of number one fault for uh, claim substantiation. If it doesn't reflect your claims exactly, you could end up with some trouble there. So we can really help with that kind of advice as well. We can help with questionnaire design. So why choose us? Um, so before I go on to question and answer, <laughs> a little bit of self-promotion. So as you've heard, uh, you know, we are a provider consumer research for uh, claim substantiation, but why use us in particular? So we're an award-winning winning research agency. We've won awards for international business, family business. Um, so we, you know, we're very confident that we are providing a very good service of uh, research. We're GDPR compliant, of course. I know that doesn't exactly reflect in the USA, but it does mean that we are aware of all global um, data protection uh, cases. And by following GDPR, it means that we're at a really high level of data protection as well. We have an ISO 27001 where we get an audit for our data protection, uh, GDPR uh, compliance. So you know that your data is really being handed well and so is our participant data, which is also really important when you're submitting your evidence because you need to make sure that the um, data is anonymized. Uh, uh, as mentioned before, we've got undesirable event reporting, which is all made in accordance with the Cosmeto Vigilance Act. Um, so you'll be able to get that undesirable event data. Uh, we've got product liability insurance. I've already mentioned that one. We've got an ISO 9001, which is to do with our quality assurance. So you can make sure our procedures are audited as well. We're a partner to the Market Research Society, which means we get full training on correct research and questionnaire design. But it also means that, you know, we're doing our research in an ethical manner as well to follow the code of conduct. We provide bespoke reg regulatory advice to discuss that is what I do. Um, so if you've got any questions about regulation, feel free to reach out to me. And again, that will help to make sure your claims are compliant. And you get a designated study manager as well. So I know I mentioned that's what I used to do. Um, so there is someone that will know you inside and out and be happy to help uh, with all, any of your requests that you need. And you've got one person that you can contact at any point. So going to move on to question and answers now. I hope that's been really helpful, but please feel free to click on the Q&A button and type in any questions that you may have and I will do my very best to answer them. If uh, no one's got any questions right now, but if you wanna answer, ask a question later on as well. Don't feel under pressure. Uh, you can always email me as well. I have my contact information at the end. And I'm also going to email out the recording afterwards. So you'll be able to reply to that as well when you can get hold of me. So if there's nothing burdening right now, but you have some questions that come, come into mind later on, you can ask me. So I don't think I've got any questions coming in. So I will move on. Oh. Um, so just to finish off, uh, training events with the SCS. Oh, I've got a question on you. That would happen. <laughs> Always happens. So how do you resolve conflicting data between instrumental data and consumer? It's an interesting question and it doesn't tend to happen. Um, so we've had it before where we've had um, claims that are clinical um, that have come through to us and our consumer data hasn't necessarily reflected it. Um, generally what happens then, so in that example, the clinical data was actually on the ingredients of the product themselves and not on the final product. So the reason it conflicted is because the final product had never been tested. And actually we found that our consumers didn't find those effects when they had the supplement that kind of um, used it all together. So that's kind of an example of when it can conflict. 
generally though if there's clinical data already in place the consumer data tends to just back it up um, and again vice versa so really often we might do it for um, claims where you might have a very small clinical data survey um, which is a really small pool of people but just gives that scientific evidence and then we do a consumer base to open that up to much more people so like i said generally it's not really seen that often um, it would be a real case by case um, basis. If a product has been manufactured to have the claims that it's supposed to, well, to have the benefits and to have the claims that it's supposed to have, it's really unlikely that actually that we don't see that we substantiate those claims. So sorry if that's not the best answer, <laughs> um, but that's certainly in my experience, um, it just doesn't really happen very much. And if it does happen, it may be a case of going back to the formulation and checking, you know, what, what's going on there instead. Um, but certainly we look at it on a case by case basis as well. So sorry, it kind of answered it, but not really too much. I'll just check to see if we have any more questions coming quickly. I'll keep going, but feel free to put another question if you've got any more questions. Oh, <laughs> um, so can the consumer market research be used as evidence in defending claims for the advertising agency? Will this be considered as substantial evidence? It very much depends on the claim. But yes, a lot of our consumer research data is substantiates your claims um, for the advertising agencies. So they're the people that look at, your, uh, look at your claims. So as mentioned, the FDC, as long as your claims are worded in the right way, and as long as you haven't got anything kind of scientific in there, and depending on what kind of claim it is, the consumer research data will be enough. So the reason I'm saying that is, for example, you can't say clinically proven if you've got consumer research data. Um, you can't say things like it reduces, um, you can't, you have to word it in a way that's to do with the perception of the product. So you can't say it, it reduces all signs of aging. You would have to say um, signs of aging appear reduced because it's what the consumer's viewing. So you see what I mean? It's kind of um, it always you can do it, but it, you just have to be really cautious of the wording that you're making because there's this, you can't sort of say anything objective because it's not objective data; it's subjective data. So it does completely substantiate your claims. You can use it as evidence against advertising agencies. We do it on a you know, weekly basis, our, our evidence is used to substantiate and is used to be presented for advertising agencies. But if your claims are incorrectly worded or kind of too strongly worded in the first place, that data is not going to be enough. And again, anything that needs a measurement, anything that requires a measurement to be able to make the claim 10 times stronger, hair times 10, 10 times stronger, we can't say that through consumer research. So that's going to have to have clinical research. So as I mentioned, um, don't kind of panic about it and go god what do i use we can um you know you can come to us with the claims that you want to make and we've got partners that provide clinical research as well so we can say for example okay we can substantiate this this and this for our consumer study which is going to reduce cost for you and it's going to be much quicker but this kind of claim you should have one test which will be about hair strength and that's going to be a clinical claim um so as mentioned the main thing with clinical studies is you have um, lots of different claims about your product and actually if you do a clinical study it's going to be a different instrumental test for every single claim that's going to be incredibly expensive whereas for a consumer study you can get all of your claims and one test and there might be one claim that you just need to get that extra evidence for so it's a really it's not always a case of using one or the other but it's just utilizing what you can to make sure you've got the right evidence in place to make sure you can kind of save the money and make sure you'll um, make sure you get things done as quickly as possible as well. As I mentioned, there is a webinar that I did last week, which is about specifically consumer versus clinical validation. And I think if that's kind of, kind of thing you're interested in, I would really recommend uh, watching it. You can request the recording from me if you haven't got it, um, because it really does summarize everything to do with that. Um, in a bit more detail because otherwise I'll just talk about it all day. <laughs> so sorry, I'll, I'll kind of leave it there. So just to carry on, but I will be there for any questions that come in. Um, so the SDS distance learning course, if you're interested in doing a course in the essentials of cosmetic science, you can do that anywhere in the world. And they've got the website address there if that's something you're interested in. And there's also going to be the IFSCC Congress in London on the 19th to the 22nd of September. So you can register your interest at their website now. 
Um, and there's the contact information for me as well. So as I said, I will be sending out a follow-up email, so don't panic. Um, and you can reply to me directly if you've got any questions. Um, and, and like I said, I've got a whole um, library of webinars. So if there's anything that you want to know about in particular, I can send those kind of recordings through to you. You can also have a look on our LinkedIn page. I post them all on there. Um, and I hope that's been really insightful for you all. I know that's a lot of information condensed into sort of 15 minutes worth of webinar, um, but I hope it's been really, really helpful. And if there's any questions you have and you want to email me, please feel free to. And I hope you all have a lovely rest of your day. Thank you.